I really do mean it. It's uh, great to see you again. Many of the faces I haven't seen since your beginning semester. And so I'm honored to be here because I believe now you're all done, or most of you are all done. And so now the real work begins. And so what you've done is, it doesn't compare uh, to what you're about to do. The uh, subject that I was uh, asked to talk about uh, is leadership and innovation and why is uh, leadership uh, important, what does it have to do with innovation, uh, and so that's really what we want to talk about. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself for those of you who I don't know or don't know me. Um, I am a consultant. I'm one of those people who just tells people what to do, and I don't have to sit there and do it. It's the easy job. Um, 4D Leadership House has been in existence for a number of years in the United States, and most recently in Tunisia. We work in, on exactly the same subject that we're talking about today. You know, how to innovate, how to become innovative leaders, because as we will see, the two are intrinsically tied. You can't really be one without being the other. Um, I teach, and that's the fun part of what I do. And um, uh, so let's just begin by saying, I wanted this to be the first slide to begin with. Take a look at the companies that I have just listed here and see what any or all of them mean to you. And why am I bringing them up? It's an interesting, because I was doing a little bit of research last night on this topic. None of these companies exist today. Yet at one point, they were all leaders in their own field. They had smart people working for them. They had great engineers and great CEOs and tremendous business models. I call them, what we have an expression in the States, it's called fat, dumb, and happy. Not literally fat, dumb, and happy, but perhaps the last word. But it's what happens when companies stop believing in innovation and staying alive and start believing <coughs> their own success stories. As Bill Gates once said, success is the enemy of innovation. Once you get to a certain point, you stop thinking of staying ahead. And it's exactly what happened to these companies. And so, I'd like to share with you <clears throat> the next point is innovate or die. Innovate or die is exactly what the, me what the message is that I share with a lot of business leaders, a lot of young entrepreneurs. You need to innovate or you will vanish because if you don't vanish, your market will change, your competition changes, your employees change and you find yourself not in a position of leadership anymore. Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage change. Change, innovation, it's the same thing really. It's managing change and creating innovation. The greatest, single, most probably challenging aspect to a business is lack of innovation. And so, how do we innovate and why is that the job of leadership? Leadership is about looking into the future. And therefore, when you think future, you think staying alive, you think competitive advantage, you think sustainability, you think creativity, you think innovation. And so I always believed that the two were tied together. And so today, most of us, a lot of us, a lot of business owners that I, that I talk to, especially in the MENA region, there's still that myth of innovation equals technology. There's still that myth that innovation and invention and creativity are all tied together. Innovation has lots to do with many other variables. Your employees, your market, your competitors, as you will discuss or have already discussed the business models that you, you deal with, how the industry evolves over time. 
And so innovation involves the introduction of new things, something new. And so in addition to business processes and or products or services that we introduce, there is a very important part, the third piece of the pie, and that is who makes it all work? Who puts it all together? It's the human side of innovation. It's the human side of leadership. So I believe when you speak of leadership, you have to speak of innovative leadership to stay alive. There is a myth in innovation that to innovate, you need that star genius. You need that Bill Gates. You need that Steve Jobs. You need that Thomas Edison. Well, the truth of the matter is that they're not walking in through that door right now in a lot of the companies you work in. It's not about the genius anymore. It's about how to make all those geniuses that work for you work together. And that's what the job of the leader is. It's creating that environment that we, when you don't have a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Albert Einstein or Thomas Edison, how do you make them all little mini Bill Gates and little mini Steve Jobs? And that's the challenge that faces us today. And it's a bigger challenge because as technology has evolved, culture has evolved, Many of the leadership styles have not evolved. They have remained the same. They have stuck, been stuck in a time room where you see companies that are in a 21st century style of or a product or development or service development, yet the leadership and the style of managing and running that company <coughs> is still 19th or early 20th century style of do as I say, not as I not do as I say, not as I do. Right? I always get that confused. And so, it's about people working together. It's really that simple. And if it is that simple, why isn't everyone doing it? Sorry, just skipped. Not everyone is doing it because it takes a change, a change of habit, a change of culture. It takes sharing that with the people that you work with. And so, if we are about creating excellence, we are about finding the best of everyone and putting it together, it's like a recipe. I always like an innovative leader to a chef, a gourmet chef, who has all of these ingredients within his reach, within his kitchen, and coming up with the best ideas, with the best, and putting it all together, and the best dishes. That's exactly what innovative leadership is all about. You have ingredients, and the ingredients could be the tools that you work with, could be the technology, but you also have little assistants that work with you. And each has to have the right task and the right tools to do the job. And that's what my job is as a leader. I create an environment, I create a culture where innovation becomes a standard. And so creating, I call it the innovation, the innovation engine, which consists of three pieces. There is the culture of an organization. There are the values of an organization upon which that company is spinning, is turning, principles, guidelines. And there is also the structure, the organizational structure. How do you have it built? Do you have silos? Do you have independent departments that each work? And, you know, on its own, each has its own vision, each has its own strategy, and how do they talk to each other if they do talk to each other? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples that exemplify that. So the culture, meaning that through that risk-taking, through that expression of uh, freedom of expression, expressing ideas, uh, creating, encouraging new ideas, uh, it, embracing failure, all of that becomes the culture of a company. 
When people are afraid to take risks, you will no longer hear new ideas. You will have, you will end up with a lot of doers, people who are just there to do a specific job. You need to create an atmosphere of transforming people from good employees to great employees. People who are not afraid to step up and say, hey, I've got this idea, what about, yes, great, what do you need? Let's make it work. That's the culture. Take the risk. And I think a lot of you will be talking probably the next few hours about disruptive innovation. If you don't disrupt your products or your services, sometimes you have to do it on your own to stay ahead of the curve. Others will do it for you. So creating the right climate, creating the right culture for your employees to do the best they can is paramount. It's every leader's job. The next one is values. You know, the values that we instill in our people. Do they believe in you? Do you believe in them? Do you both believe the same thing? The biggest misconception and the biggest thing that I see nowadays is everyone talks about mission and vision statement. And I can tell you, I will not list names, but some of the biggest multinational and even technology companies in Tunisia today, I have done surveys and I've asked 10, 15, 20 people and I don't get two answers exact answers of what the vision of a company is. What are you here for? What are you trying to accomplish? I got my job. That's not great leadership. These are not signs of companies who will stay alive and stay ahead of the curve. So that's, it's important to believe what everyone else believes. To share your ideas with everyone from the entry level, first year engineer, to the senior engineer who's been with you for 10, 15 years. Everyone needs to be going the same direction. And it's just not words. You need to put it to work. And there are ways of doing that. Does your staff believe in you? Creates, does your staff trust you? Do people trust you? We have an element, that's a cultural thing. We're going through a period today in Tunisia where trust is like hard currency, it's like the euro these days. <laughs> You know, we can't get a hold of it. It's a problem not only in our society, but it's a problem in our companies. I can't be talking innovation to companies where employees don't trust each other and don't trust management. It's a waste of time. I have refused jobs as a consultant to be talking about this when there is that fiber that holds or an organization together is not there. How do you create trust? How do you create trust? And this is an answer not only today in, in business that we have to answer, we have to answer it also on a global level. It is when your employees start seeing that management isn't working for the management. It's, I mean, it's as simple as that. They're working for us. No leader will be successful in private enterprise or in, politi in, in politics or anything. If your subordinates don't see that you're working for them, not the other way around. Someone recently said at a conference, he said it's like the, he is a retired general from the U.S. Navy. He says we have a tradition in the U.S. Navy where the general eats last. Okay, eats last, your food will be cold. Right? But there is an analogy. What he was trying to say, if you're a leader, you make sure everyone else beneath you, in your rank. As Ethan, his feet are warm, he's in bed, and he's safe and secure. Only then, as a leader, will these people tomorrow think of you as number one. You gain their trust. Today, I talk to companies where they say, aha, PTJ, he's driving a Mercedes. That's probably come from my money over the last two years. There is no trust there. So how can we be talking innovative innovation in a company like that, where that fiber has broken down? So it's important, not only that we believe what they believe, it's important they trust us. It's important that if I have a team of developers that they trust me and I trust them. Because once you do that, you don't have to reward people financially to be motivated. The moment they stop working for themselves and work for you, then you know you're successful. And let me explain that, because that goes against what most other people say. 
meaning that they work for you, meaning that they will sacrifice. And you, <coughs> it represents here the organization. The moment when people, when your organization goes from the 5 p.m. organization to the 24-7 organization, you're, you've become a successful leader. What does that mean? 5 p.m. when you look out the window, the parking lot is not empty. People, if they, if they have work, they will still then work. They're not working on the clock. It's no longer a transaction between the leadership, the management, and the employees. It's a relationship. When you see someone taking their laptop over the weekend to take it home to finish the project, you know that employee is doing it for the organization, not for a paycheck. These are all signs when you know that an organization is heading towards innovation because it is recreating itself. When an organization recreates itself over the years, it's got great leadership. It reminds me of a quick anecdote, a quick story. Someone recently wrote a book, and I had met him, an admirer of Jim Collins, who wrote a book called <coughs> From Good to Great, What Makes Good Leaders Great Leaders. There was a study there, he pointed out to you, and it was an incredible study. I never really thought about it. He studied the, there's a magazine in the US that lists, it's called the Fortune 100, that lists the top 100 companies in the world, it used to just be in the US, but in the world today, based on specific criteria, most of it's quantifiable, revenues, you know, growth, profit and earnings, that sort of stuff. And the study was very specific, and he studied this from a, a leadership point of view. There were, and he conducted interviews in addition to the study of about 15,000, I recommend this book, by the way. It's called Good to Great. The author is Jim Collins, and I'm not getting a commission on it. And he interviewed nearly 15,000 business owners, uh, uh, companies, and he came up with a list of about 15 companies. They're great companies. And what do they have in common? They have in common great leaders. And so based on that, he defined what a great leader was. So he calls it a level five leadership. You know? And then he realized there was one thread, one common denominator to all of them. All of these leaders did not finish at the top of their classes. They were average to mediocre students when they were at Harvard and Yale and Brown and MIT and some of these other schools. It was an interesting, so he, he performed further studies. I'm going to skip, I don't know how much time I have, to, to, to the next radio. These people were not experts when they graduated their schools. They were not top of their class. And he, he concluded that sometimes expertise <coughs> goes against the nature of innovation and running a company and running a company. I got away from it. I don't know if anybody can hear me. I sort of forgot. So you, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. When you have experts, many experts running the show, they, that tends to be counterproductive to what you're trying to accomplish. Because to you go back to the analogy I used earlier of the Navy, the soldiers are never good enough to what the, expert, the experts' expectations are. And experts tend to be gatekeepers. They tend to be bad gatekeepers because they may be experts in their domains, but they're not great idea identifiers. And to be an innovator, you have to have great ideas at work. And so experts may not, may not be great leaders. Experts are are experts for a reason. They spend way too many time, too much time studying and, and honing their skill. And not as much time interacting with the masses of the organization. And so this study showed that about 85% of these companies are run by people who, who had on average a grade of a B minus to a C plus, which is the equivalent to maybe 14 sur 20, 13 sur 20. And the people who finished these schools with A and A minus with honor, they were experts, they were geniuses, they were running departments, they were department heads. But the ones who were less 
in terms of intellectually, that less of an expert, we're the ones running the show. I'm not saying don't be expert. That's not at all the message that I'm saying here. I just wanted to give you an analogy that sometimes when we hire, when we hire, we want to hire the best. So we hire lots of experts. And everyone's great, has got a great idea and everyone believes their idea is the best. And that usually gets in the way of innovation. When you have way too many experts, we've seen that on Monday mornings, where our football team loses. We're all coaches and we all could have done better than the previous day. So that's the point that I wanted to, to make. So with businesses that I have come across, there are two common themes. Problems that occur all the time. <clears throat> and the first one is the failure to effectively leverage the expertise of employees. And I will touch again on it because what I, I'm going to recommend a couple of things. And then the failure to react effectively when new ideas do arise. And that has to do with what I was speaking about, and I'll explain further. These two themes expose two, two common points. The first one is communication, and the second one is the bad gatekeepers. The bad gatekeepers I spoke about, and they could be experts who become, expertise becomes the currency of an organization, experts become best judges of good ideas, and that's not always necessarily true, because their standards are so high in their field of expertise, but they, don't, they fail oftentimes to look at ideas globally, from a customer's point of view, from a competitor's point of view, from a marketing point of view. Egos get in the way, and we lead the world in, in egos. I mean, it's, I, I think, I always explain that as a cultural thing. You know, we have more experts in Tunisia per capita than any other country I've visited. And everyone introduces themselves as, as experts. Uh, information is not always available or distributed in a timely fashion. It's something that I've experienced in many of these organizations. It's a power trip. We call it power trip in, in, in the States, which means what? I have the information. I'm the leader. I'm only going to give you just enough to do that little... I don't want to give you all that you need. You might rise in the ranks, and you may compete with me when there is job security. I'm going to give, in French we call it good good. I'm going to give just enough to keep you alive. And this happens nearly, nearly across the board. And there are many, there are a few companies where I haven't seen this, but I've seen it in more companies than not. It has to do with the previous point, with the ego factor. Too much emphasis is spent on research and development and not enough on people. Goes back to the expertise. Lots of focus on technology. Oh yeah, forget the latest this and the latest that and the latest. So you got all these gadgets and tools, but who does who makes them work? Is the question that it is the issue that many of these companies run into. <clears throat> so uh, I, I mentioned to you the, the book. I just wrote it there so I don't forget it. That good, the great book. So the solution. Oops. So what are the solutions? The solutions are always, I had an old professor at Harvard who always said, Mr. Saibi, the solution is in the room, you just have to find it. The solution is always in the room, you just have to know where to look. And the solutions to lack of innovation or not enough innovation or vanishing, it's usually within your organization. You just have to be willing and able to adapt and change as leadership so that you could make that work. I often ask human resource directors <coughs> who go to great length and trouble to recruit someone, to steal them from a competitor, to bring someone who's a star. And many times, and someone here from human resources, many times, eight, nine months, a year later, that relationship is divorce. The company can't wait to get rid of that employee or he can't wait to find another job. What happened? Did he or she all of a sudden become dumb? Fat, dumb and happy at the age? No. What happened? Did the company all of a sudden not, is not what he thought? The emphasis, the problems could be a number of, of problems that I have just listed there. Communication, not enough motivation, not enough share, not enough ideas are being exchanged. Information is coming through a funnel and being piped into someone. Do this, do this, do this, do that. 
you hire experts, you hire people who are intelligent, and all of a sudden you just hand them, give them orders. So a lot of it is within us. A lot of it gets away from the expertise and it becomes a behavior. I honestly believe that innovation has to do with our behavior as managers. And how do we behave in a group setting? How do we behave? How do we get the best? How do we extract the best out of each so that I can put them together in that part that I talked to you about and make a best tasting dish as a chef? That's innovation. That's innovation. And so people with complementary talents need to talk more. Not enough. And we see this in small companies and in big companies. Everyone, uh, you're that department. And you're that, especially us, we, in, we inherited the Franco, the French system. Uh, and I don't want to say European, there's some Germans in here. But, but it is, it's a, it's a French system. And I, I'm not knocking it down. They always say that I am because I'm Anglo Saxon. There's a little bit of truth to that. But the, there is something back to it because our statue in, 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 the, in an organization is our title. Ah, oh, Mr. Engineer, Mr. This, Mr. Whatever title you have. And so we put a lot of emphasis on that. And so everyone has these very rigid guidelines that you don't step out of. People, information is thrown up and down, not horizontally. There is no collaboration. I, I love, there is a creative way an American company did this most recently to create cohesiveness and collaboration within departments they created visas because they had the marketing director, the sales, the finance, and all the typical issues between different departments. And so they said, okay, what if we give you a visa for 30 days, for 60 days, for a year? You have the permission to go from finance to sales, from research and development to marketing. Learn how that department works. They can send us someone, like an exchange program. And before you know it, that became the culture of the company. And all of a sudden, there are no more rigid lines. Senior Vice President of Marketing, Senior Vice President of Finance. And God forbid, God forbid, I'm tempted to give you an example. We have a company probably all use that are one of three telecommunication companies. God forbid these Senior Vice Presidents have a certain reward program. Number of telephones you sell or whatever. Then the objective becomes that particular reward. Regardless of what happens as a corporation, oh, we have we get in the deep up on how many minutes we sell over, you know, three G, whatever it is. Uh, I'm just making this stuff up. So that becomes your stress. Your strategy is to work towards that particular goal, and it breaks down all the relationships and all the communication lines that have to exist between you and the other departments. You know, so rapidly test and refine ideas, bottleneck, sap the energy, and demotivate people. We are also another thing that we're good at. And if anyone is trying to open up companies like I have, many I know companies who people have stopped. The red tape, the bureaucracy. Try to get an idea past the senior vice president. Oh, he has to study it, take it home, sit on it, leave it in his car for a week, talk to someone. We'll have a, have a meeting that, come on, you've all lived this in the Tunisian administration and in organizations that where you've probably done stage or, or two. We don't act quickly enough. We're not rapid. We're not fast enough. You know, because our teams are too big, our bureaucracy is too big. And we have to study, we have to think about it. God forbid a vice president of, of research and say, I have no idea what that is. Come with me, let's sit down and explain it to me. And those five words, I have traveled a span of a hundred year civilization from a, a, a 19th century organization to a 21st century organization. A vice president, a leader, a top manager who says to one of his supporters, come explain to me, I have no idea what this is. Show me. Let's, yes, sign off on it. Boom. Go do it. That doesn't happen. That's another obstacle for innovation. And when you have a great idea and you go to your boss and, you, and you, you're excited about this new way of innovating something, a new procedure, a new product, a new service, and he sits on it, 
And it sits, not literally, but maybe sometimes literally sits on it. I don't know. But you lose interest. You're just like, oh, maybe they don't care. And that's the, the energy that gets sucked out of the life of a company because of too many procedures, too many processes. So that needs to be eliminated. Small is good. I just talked about that. Rapid and agile. You know, uh, I, I put there in, in, in parentheses, new metric, Google per employee. Google, if you read, there was an article in the Financial Times just last week about the revenues generated per employee as a new metric and how quickly they get paid on it. I worked in Wall Street. I wasn't one of those bright guys that made $3 million a year, but I worked in Wall Street, so I have a little an idea on how quickly financial salespeople get paid. They get paid next week on last, uh, on last week's sales. That keeps you motivated, that keeps you going. You innovate new ways of going and having meetings and presenting new financial products and so forth and so on. But if you're an organization of 500 or 600 people, it's understandable that things, you're not a, a rapid and agile and quick company. But that new metric there, now Google Human Resource Department, they don't call it Human Resource Department, I forgot what they call it, it's the, I can't remember. It was, it's, it's kind of a cute name. Instantaneously, you can go into that particular, uh, the, the, intra, uh, the intranet site and know exactly where your idea is, what you've done, it's there. They're using the technology. That's why earlier I said adopting technology is part of what new leadership does. Think twice about who to promote the leadership position. Make sure they're not, they're not after a title. Make sure they are people who adopt and adapt to new ways and new behaviors. Synergy and energy. You need to have the energy physically and mentally, but also create synergy within your team. There shouldn't be just gaps between management and employees. They're saying them, and they're saying them. Be an early adopter of new technologies. This is the 21st century after all, and we do have companies today who are on the Tunisian bourse the stock market where the CEO does not have an email account. I know this for a fact. I have sat with professors at universities here in Tunisia who have no social media accounts. Not that I am cool or, you know, Twitter and Facebook, but you need to communicate. You need to, because why is that important? Not having a Twitter or a Facebook or Foursquare account isn't what I'm talking about. The people who work for you, they're not 80 years old. They're not even the X generation. We ran out of alphabets. They are something new generation. They were the Facebook generation. They are the Facebook generation. So by not adopting new technologies and understanding how these technologies work slows you down. You can't relate to new employees. We're seeing that today as the first and second generation of bosses in Tunisia is retiring and will probably in the next five years. The, the remaining ones from the you know, Bourguiba administration, we see them, the 70-year-old that inherited from his dad in 1970, and they're running companies today. They're losing market share. They're not hiring the right people. Their turnover rate is increasing, into double digits sometimes. And when you talk to them, when they call you, ah, I got these stupid people who don't understand anything. Come and fix them. You understand what I'm saying? So there is that disconnect with the reality, disconnect. So that's why I say adopting new technology and adapting to new ways of running is important. Listen to your customers. I have to tell you, I'm finished now. I know you're probably going to kill me. I have to tell you a quick story that I've lived with. I've seen it with my own eyes. It was the opening of Apple Store in 2006 or 2007 in Boston. And my son and I were walking, and he was driving me crazy about all this new iPhones. It was just like the first generation. So I said, I'm not sitting in line overnight. I mean, we went, we walked by the day before, and there were people the day before around the block. And I said, Jamel, I'm not doing it. I don't care. I, you know, we paid an extra two or three hundred dollars, but I'm not sitting out in, in a sleeping bag. Who do I see sitting on the sidewalk like this? 
and his jeans and his baseball cap playing with a bunch of kids. None other than Steve Jobs. None other than Steve Jobs. And I said, all of a sudden, I said, my son, and I said, he goes, Dad, I thought you said you want to go. I said, go. <laughs> and I talked to him, and he's done that. God bless his soul. For three or four years, for every opening of new store. And so I said, what are you working on? He says, my new vision. He says, I have nothing to do with the vision of the company. It's my customers. My customers tell me what I should be working on. And that's what listening to your customers means. There was a survey recently by uh, L'Economiste Maghribin or something like that. 250 companies in Tunisia, the majority don't know who their customers are. And so, I blame it on leadership. But I go step up, I don't blame it on them. I blame it on the culture of leadership. On the fact that they don't know what they don't know. And I'm optimistic because you will know. You'll have no choice because you're going to be competing with companies that your this generation of leaders didn't compete with. There are no more borders. You'll be competing with companies in Germany, in France, in the United States, in Singapore, in China, who have better business models, better market conditions. You need to create and innovate so that you can compete. I think I ran out of time. I can't speak anymore, so I thank you again for the invitation. I hope I could be of service. I certainly follow some of you on Facebook and on social media. Yes, I do have two Facebook accounts, and, uh, and I wish you the best, and I'm proud of you.